uh, Mr. Cao was then known when he founded, when the organization was founded as an innocuous civil servant and additional secretary in the research and analysis wing of the cabinet secretariat. And the 1965 was a tipping point, actually, because uh, India failed to have a strategic intelligence uh, uh, which could be utilized to uh, neutralize Pakistan. For instance, we didn't uh, realize that Pakistan was running out of ammunition. And if India had pushed for that war for another couple of days, perhaps Pakistan would have been on its knees. He was the one who uh, had sources inside that camp, who got photographs of the layout of the camp and the courses that were being run by Jaish-e Mohammed uh, for the uh, jihadis there. Uh, because of the searing experience of 2611, when we didn't have the targets, uh, some of us felt that, well, if this happens once again, we should have the target. So there was foresight. And so Mr. Kao always believed in bringing ext extra options which he could present to the political masters. Right. He had a great ability to network. He had a great ability to lead and yet remain behind the scene. And that's, that's how. And he was a man of action. So, in fact, in Hindi, uh, he said once to uh, someone that, Nasihat mat do, namuna bano. Be an example. Uh, don't give advice, free advice. Free advice is of no use to anyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here on a chilly, lovely Delhi afternoon. And uh, honored to be here on this panel with uh, Nitin Bhai and Mr. Kumar. Uh, Nitin, of course, needs no introduction. He's one of India's best-known defense and strategic analysts, and he's written several books we just heard of. And uh, Mr. Kumar was a former special secretary in uh, the RNAW. And those who know about Mr. Kumar, know about Mr. Kumar. <laughs> That's all I'll say. <laughs> but um, this book that we are talking about here today is... Uh, uh, Nitin Bai's uh, book, uh, Gentleman Spy Master. It's possibly only the second book that's been written on uh, Mr. Kao, and it's because uh, Mr. Kao passed on in uh, 2002. We're well, just at the turn of the century, so not many people know about what he did, and a lot of the stuff that he did was um, silent, and he's a man who stayed in the shadows, very unlike a lot of uh, things that are done today. They, you know. Uh, you do a lot of stuff, it's out in the open almost immediately, but he worked in the shadows. And uh, I want to start by talking about spying itself, you know. Spying is something your parents would tell you not to do, you know, you know because you, your parents tell you not to lie, not to cheat, not to steal. But that's exactly what spies do, right? And countries do this all the time. They lie, they cheat, they steal. And you have a country to the north of India, which is literally uh, stolen billions, if not trillions worth of uh, intellectual property and it's literally built its industries on that. But nations do spying and they have spy masters. And that's what Arun Kao was. He was a spy master. He created this fantastic organization called the RNAW. Uh, the research and analysis wing and in three years time they delivered one of the most spectacular results of the 20th century and I'm not exaggerating this the creation of Bangladesh it's possibly one of the biggest achievements that any country has carried out in the 20th century you've defeated an occupying occupying army and uh, liberated a country and today you can see the difference between Bangladesh and Pakistan the two countries that came out of uh, 1947, look where Bangladesh is today and look where Pakistan is today. And that country was created primarily because of uh, Mr. Arun Kao. In just three years he created this organization. But without much ado, I want to start by asking Nitin about this book. Nitin, fantastic book again. Um, tell us how difficult it was to put together a book about a person that not many people know about. And this is a person who never gave any interviews. He's never written anything. There's so little of him in the public domain. Tell us this challenge of putting this biography together. Oh, well, it was challenging. But yes, a lot of help from the organization, RNAW, uh, because many of its uh, serving and retired people uh, shared their memories, their knowledge of Mr. Kao. 
and the working of the organization. Uh, and I must say this, that uh, it was very difficult to uh, initially when it was proposed that uh, this should be written. Uh, and I was given barely four months to write this biography, by the way. I was told in July of 2019 that uh, can you do this by September 21st, which is the uh, foundation day of uh, RNAW. Uh, and I said, well, it's difficult, but thanks to uh, people like Kumar, primarily, uh, who had collected a lot of uh, anecdotes and records and uh, correspondence of Mr. Kao uh, officially uh, when he was still serving that time. And many other uh, people, like I must mention, particularly Mr. Vapala Balachandran, who was also in the RNAW, he was a spy like him. Uh, Mr. Vikram Sood, who was the chief of the RNAW. All of these people actually encouraged and uh, helped in uh, putting this uh, thing together. Well, words are mine, but uh, all the thoughts, uh, all the information, the raw information came from various sources. Initially, the family was also very reluctant, but uh, the RNW prevailed on them that this needs to be done because it's a tribute to a man who's uh, not known outside the official circles or, or the, the circles that uh, he worked uh, within. And uh, it was needed because it was also his uh, uh, centenary year. 2019 uh, uh, would have been his centenary year. He was born in uh, 1919, 1918, 18, if I'm not 18. 18. Yeah, 1918. So he was already 100. And, he would have been 101 years old, and it was required that this uh, at least a brief glimpse of his uh, life and achievements should come out for people like us. One thing that he did, he didn't give an interview. We say, uh, but he gave one interview to Popul Jaikar, who was the uh, biographer of Indira Gandhi and a close friend of the then Prime Minister, uh, which was available in a book. But he himself had uh, uh, tape recorded his memoirs in uh, different segments, uh, starting from his early life to, uh, to the end of his career or to even uh, later. And he had kept those files, they were transcribed. Those tapes were transcribed and kept in the Nehru Memorial Library, now the uh, Prime Minister's uh, Memorial and uh, Library. Uh, and uh, some of them were available publicly, uh, seven or eight files of his early life, his early achievements, early operations. So that helped. Yeah. Uh, so this was the uh, background in which uh, I wrote this book. Thanks, Nidhma. And you know, that thing of raw information, going through a lot of raw information to distill it into this book, that is quite an achievement. Now, the operative word being raw. Mr. Kumar, I want to ask you, why raw why research and analysis wing it sounds like a you know a wing of the delhi university thank you sandeep uh, uh, first of all let me just say that it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here among so many bright minds to answer your question why this anodyne expression uh, in some ways it is not unique i mean there are many intelligence agencies all over the world which have these innocuous sounding titles. Uh, uh, unlike, say, the Central Intelligence Agency, which uh, sort of very explicitly states what it does. I think uh, Nitin has mentioned it in his book that the credit for this uh, anodyne uh, uh, title uh, perhaps goes to the then Cabinet Secretary, Mr. D.S. Joshi who uh, came up with his expression, research and analysis wing. And this is primarily because, uh, you know, there was a time or when the agency was created, it was so secretive yeah. that we did not even acknowledge its existence. <laughs> In intelligence parlance, that's called the agency being unavowed. Uh, this was the pattern that many countries followed, uh, Britain, for example, never acknowledged that an agency like the MI6 existed till a few years ago. So we also followed that pattern. The idea was to be as low-key, as unobtrusive as possible. So it was tucked away, this research and analysis wing of the cabinet secretariat. And uh, Mr. Kao was then known when he founded, when the organization was founded, as an innocuous civil servant and additional secretary in the research and analysis wing of the cabinet secretariat. And uh, Mr. Kao and the classical intelligence operatives believed that intelligence is most effective when it is low key, when it is low profile, 
and remains, as uh, Sandeep correctly said, in the shadows. Uh, such agencies are actually the more potent ones than, you know, the ones that are more heavily advertised or, uh, you know, uh, go about explicitly saying uh, what they do or don't do. Uh, that is how I tend to look at it. Agencies that stay in the shadows and they need to keep their names as uh, low profile as possible and their deeds manifest more than their words. But uh, Nitin, uh, the uh, anagram of uh, RNA W, if you reverse it, you get W A R. And that takes us to 1962, which is the defeat in the China war, the border war, uh, uh, which kind of, you know, we were in that previous session where. Dr. Lairi was talking about how reform in India doesn't take place unless there's some kind of crisis. Like you had 1991, the economic reforms when you were nearly bankrupt. Tell us about 1962 and how it shaped raw, how raw emerged out of the chaos of that defeat on the China war. Sure. From uh, my research, uh, what I could gather and of course talking to people who were participants or, uh, you know, those who had... Uh, directed the war in 1962 as well as 1965. So it's a combination of the two wars. So one was with China in 1962 and the other was uh, the 1965 war with Pakistan. Now in 1962, uh, even as uh, the war was winding down or the, uh, or the Chinese were uh, sort of declaring a ceasefire in, on November 20th, 1962, uh, the government had decided to form a Tibetan resistance uh, force uh, known as the uh, SFF, which was also formed uh, in the immediate aftermath of uh, the 1962 defeat, which was entrusted again to uh, you know uh, the uh, the people in the intelligence agencies that time, and Mr. Kao was fairly high up in the hierarchy that time, so he was part of that uh, initial team which set up the SFF. Uh, then, of course, came the uh, Aviation Research Center, which is uh, which used to obtain. Uh, electronic and technology or, or technical based uh, intelligence and uh, was again formed in 1963 with the help of the Americans by the way. So he uh, knew exactly what was needed and what was uh, the requirement of the day and uh, those times were difficult for India because India was uh, not as rich or as uh, prosperous as it was then. Uh, it was difficult. There were two adversaries already and the 1965 was a tipping point actually. Because uh, India failed to have a strategic intelligence uh, uh, which could be utilized to uh, neutralize Pakistan. For instance, we didn't uh, realize that Pakistan was running out of ammunition. And if India had pushed for that war for another couple of days, perhaps Pakistan would have been on its knees. And there was, uh, because they had run out of ammunition. Uh, but uh, that intelligence wasn't available and there was a lot of debate post that war that external intelligence should not be the duty of the intelligence bureau, which used to be doing both intelligence uh, within the country as well as intelligence outside the country. And therefore, uh, when Mrs. Indira Gandhi became the Prime Minister, she took this uh, thing. So, uh, adversaries, uh, adversities rather, uh, bring out, uh, like in India's case, uh, in many cases, uh, the best out of people and best out of the uh, machinery uh, the government has. And that's, I think, what prompted uh, the formation of RNW. The stars got aligned. Mrs. Gandhi became the Prime Minister. Her closest advisor, P. N. Haksar, uh, who uh, also knew Ramji Kao very well. They were both, all three of them were Kashmiri uh, Brahmins uh, who were ruling the Rus that time. And they came together. And she saw the uh, reasoning and uh, the uh, necessity of a separate external intelligence wing or external intelligence agency for the country. And therefore, Right. So, Mr. Kumar, this um, creation of RAW in 68, firstly, you know, if you could explain to us, why do you need an external intelligence agency? It's a very basic question. But, you know, in the light of what we've been seeing in the last couple of decades, you started this century with one of the most spectacular intelligence failures of all time, where you have the CIA looking at all these intelligence reports. Why are Arabs training to fly planes in Florida? You know, and they disregard that right down to October 7th, just in the run-up to that, when you have Israel getting all this intel of uh, Hamas planning to attack, and they say that hey, the Hamas can't do it. They can't carry out an attack like this. They get it a, a year in advance. With all this in uh, uh, mind, and of course, we've had our spectacular triumphs and a few failures, 
26 alerts piling up and uh, nobody to sit and piece the puzzles together. Why this thing of attacks on five-star hotels and terrorists coming by boats and all of that wasn't put together. But why is an intelligence agency, an external intelligence agency, so critical for us? What is the task that it does that is different from, say, the Intelligence Bureau? And why RNW had to be hived out of the IB in 1968? Could just give us the background. Yeah, one could actually, uh, you've raised a very fundamental point and one can talk for hours on it. So I'll just try and simplify it uh, to the extent possible. India is a vast country. We have many challenges. In fact, one, would, one can even argue perhaps that our domestic challenges, our domestic security challenges uh, are perhaps greater. Uh, it could be argued, a point could be made than those emanating from outside. Secondly, the point has also been made that, you know, these, these uh, differentiations are in a sense artificial and all security threats blend into each other. After all, we are not, uh, you know, uh, we don't look at uh, the threats coming from Pakistan uh, just for out of academic interest. We look at them because they have a direct impact on what happens on the ground within our country. Uh, so if the planning for an attack is done in, say, uh, you know, uh, Karachi or Lahore, then the attack actually materializes in, in Mumbai or Delhi. So, obviously, there is a very clear linkage. But having said all that, the point is one of emphasis and coordination. I'm trying to simplify uh, to the extent possible. Uh, there, it's a question of focus. You see, the man or the agency looking at threats in Mumbai, for instance, or in Maharashtra, uh, there could be a uh, there could be an axolite threat. There could be an Islamic a threat from Islamic terrorists. There could be many other uh, matters of pressing security concern. Uh, so uh, and the domestic internal agency would be focusing on those threats, whereas an agency like the RNDW keeps its attention focused on what is happening in Pakistan, what is happening in in China, uh, what is happening in, say, the Indian Ocean or Sri Lanka or whatever. That is the exclusive focus. I have often, uh, you know, in a lighter vein, uh, talked of a famous uh, Dutch footballer, Johan Cruyff, who introduced the, or who, who was a great proponent of the concept of total football. Everybody plays in every position or is a, can, should be able to play in every position. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have the more classical system where you have a center forward, you have a defender, you have people playing in specialized positions. I happen to be a believer in, in specialization. And so I dare say was Mr. Kao and Mrs. Gandhi, who actually saw the importance of creating uh, such an agency. You know, as both Nitin and uh, Sandeep mentioned, 1965, 62 and 65 were, were big wake-up calls for our country. Uh, it was felt that there was not adequate warning. The country was caught by surprise, once from China and once from Pakistan. And, and the intelligence, uh, intelligence Bureau, the undivided Intelligence Bureau, uh, which was then handling all intel, intelligence-related matters, was not able to provide that advance warning to the government of the day. So it was felt the Intelligence Bureau then might not have agreed with that assessment. But certainly there was a complaint. And in fact, in 1965, Nitin mentioned it, the complaint came from the army, actually, paradoxically. The then army chief felt that, uh, you know, the, the Intelligence Bureau had not been able, for instance, to report on the construction of a canal by Pakistan, it was called the Ichogil Canal, uh, where uh, you know uh, the tanks were uh, there uh, were stopped. So uh, uh, the, uh, the the army s felt that there was uh, the the construction of that canal had not been reported upon by the by the IV. The IV, of course, defended itself and said that they had reported. But be that as it may. 
All this led in somewhere in late 1967 for Mrs. Gandhi to call Mr. Kao, who had by then, Nitin mentioned an organization called the Aviation Research Center. He was the head of that agency and then he was heading the external intelligence wing of the intelligence bureau. She summoned him and told him to create a specialized organization modeled in many ways on the Central Intelligence Agency of, uh, of, of America and the MI6, etc. And within a year, Mr. Kao set up that organization. Now, I also spoke to one more, I spoke of one more issue, the, that of coordination. What happens when you have different agencies is that it creates a problem of coordination. Uh, you know, one focuses outside, one focuses on inside, but there has to be somebody who brings all this together. So uh, that's a different challenge. But if you do that well, then there is merit, considerable merit in having one agency look after threats coming from outside the country and another one uh, looking at what is happening within the country and then bring both of them or the strands of intelligence together. My next question uh, follows on from that, which is Balakot 2019 which is probably, again, it's a watershed in our uh, the way India approaches security threats. And it's terrorists who are training inside mainland Pakistan, not in POK, but in uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. And these terrorists are being launched across the border to attack targets in India. And India launches the Indian Air Force to strike at Jabba Top, which is where they are. And uh, Nitin's book begins with that attack on Balakot, which is again a spectacular success for Robert. Nitin, without uh, revealing too much about this, tell us how it was such a big triumph for Raw and the agency that uh, RN Gao created. And this thing of how it interacted with the internal security, this is a problem that has both internal and external security dimensions, how they kind of came together, you know, and coordinated this thing with the military doing the striking. Sure. In fact, uh, I mean, to go back to Balakot, before that, uh, you all know that Pulwama attack happened and you know, there was a suicide bomber who killed CRPF, uh, nearly 40 of them, or more, 40 plus CRPF troopers were killed in Pulwama through that suicide bomb attack. Now, it is the job of uh, both Intelligence Bureau, the military intelligence and RNAW people like him who keep a tab, who kept a tab, he in his uh, uh, role that time on Pakistan and all the people who were planning or coordinating this attack in Pulwama. Now, when, when he traced back, uh, and uh, I don't know how much I should uh, reveal here, but I must say this here for the small audience, that uh, the principal architect of the intelligence uh, for the Balakot camp of uh, Jaish e Mohammed uh, and uh, maybe even LET was, is sitting here right next to me. So, a round of applause for him. <laughs> he was the one who uh, had sources inside that camp, who got photographs of the layout of the camp and the courses that were being run by Jaish e Mohammed uh, for the uh, jihadis there, and who were being trained to uh, be suicide bombers by killers and uh, you know um, terrorists to come into India and uh, act against India. So that those photographs, those coordinates, uh, that grid, uh, which was available because of his work and because of what he had done, uh, the Indian Air Force could now actually then come up with, with in coordination with the RNAW and of course the decision makers like the Prime Minister, the National Security Advisor, to home in on to um, the target, a uh, possible target that is the Balakot camp, which was inside Pakistan, as you said, and not Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir which uh, technically or emotionally is supposed to be India's territory, right? So, uh, the signal was uh, supposed to be sent, to, a message needed to be sent to Pakistan that uh, you, you can hit us, but we can hit you uh, as well and well inside uh, your own territory. So, therefore, Balakot was chosen and therefore that intelligence was extremely important. Without that intelligence, without the numbers of people that were as assessed to be there and the kind of you know, assembly of all the terrorist uh, groups and their leaders and their cadres, uh, that would have been futile. So, therefore, Balakot. So, the coordination was extremely important and the decision had to be finally taken, which resulted in the Balakot strike, a spectacular strike in many ways. 
I am saying this in one, one, one more line to add, that even if not one terrorist was killed in the Balakot strike, let's say, as people have claimed, only a tree was hit and a crow was killed, as they say, or a cow was killed. Uh, even if that was true, uh, it still has significance in the India-Pakistan relationship, the security dimension, because India sent a message to Pakistan that we have an option of escalating without you retaliating uh, the nuclear or taking the nuclear option, which Pakistan always used to threaten before this. So calling the bluff was important and this was also the changing of the red lines in the minds of the Indian decision makers was extremely important. So far, Indian decision makers at the highest level, the Prime Minister's office and uh, the National Security Advisor and others were always afraid of crossing the Rubicon, if I can call it that. I think that was the importance of Balakot. Absolutely. And you know, uh, I, I did this book on the 26-11 attacks and I can tell you this because after the attacks, when the entire uh, the political establishment was riled and they wanted to retaliate against Pakistan, they asked for a list of targets. And uh, the uh, Air Force chief said, you give me the targets and I will strike them immediately. And the sad uh, uh, you know, conclusion was that we didn't have the locations of the terrorist camps and therefore we couldn't strike them. So that is why, uh, as uh, Nitin has already said, Mr. Kumar, that's why Mr. Kumar's task was is so uh, uh, epic, if I may call it that. The fact that to get to know where the terrorists are actually training, the exact location of those camps, is actually what intelligence agencies do. This is what they're meant to do. And this is why we need to have them as eyes and ears. Going back to the reason why RAW was created precisely for this, to manage our security threats so effectively. And I want to ask you, Mr. Kumar, about um, the 1971 war, you know, RNW was created in 1968 and literally in three years, you're thrown into the thick of battle and you have to produce results. Why was the creation of Bangladesh, was that a, uh, a task that was given to RNW and how did they do it in such a short order of time? Before I answer that, if I may just sort of... Uh parse or nuance uh, Nitin's uh, remark a little bit. Let us just say that uh, the intelligence about Balakot was generated by people like Mr. Kumar. Now coming to uh, uh, the creation of Bangladesh, uh, I think uh, Mr. Kao would have been the first person to acknowledge, very readily acknowledge, that uh, the creation of Bangladesh was not in only because of the RNDW. The RNDW played an important role, a central role, just like the Indian Army did, the Ministry of External Affairs did, uh, the Air Force did, the Navy did, and many other organizations. But it had a, a, a unique uh, role to play. Um, first and foremost, of course, uh, uh, was the very clear uh, war aim uh, or the, the, the political aim or the strategic aim that the government of India had, which was very clearly laid down by the, by the then Prime Minister of the day. So the objective was very clear, number one. Uh, number two, uh, if I may sort of expand a little bit on what all did the RNDW do, uh, one famous writer has uh, said that uh, the jobs of the RNDW in the creation of, uh, of uh, Bangladesh were fivefold. First, to generate continuous, a continuous stream of accurate intelligence about what was actually happening on the ground in, in, East, in East Pakistan at that point of time. Because there was clearly a genocide and uh, millions of refugees were uh, coming across the border. But there were, Pakistan denied that uh, that was happening and many other countries were preferring to look the other way. So uh, to generate accurate intelligence and inform the government of the day about what was happening on the ground. That was the first task. The second task was to train the uh, liberation fighters of Pakistan, uh, of, uh, of, of Eastern Pakistan. Uh, it, as you all know, they were known as the Mukti Bahini. 
The Mukti Bahini were primarily trained by the Indian Army, the great numbers of them. Uh, other agencies like the Border Security Force also played their part in the training. But within the larger Mukti Bahini, there was an elite core of some seven or 8,000 uh, people who were known as the Mujib Bahini. Nitin has referred to it in his book. These were youth who were uh, uh, very strongly motivated mm -hmm. by the leadership of uh, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. So the training of that elite core, if I may use the expression, was entrusted to uh, the head of the RNDW and an, and, and an organization called the Special uh, Frontier Force, which uh, SFF, uh, which uh, again Nitin referred to a short while ago. Uh, so, training an elite set of people within the larger Mukti Bahini was done by the RNDW. Three, networking with disgruntled uh, civil servants, diplomats, etc. of Pakistan. There were many Bengali civil servants, diplomats in Pakistani missions, etc. who were, uh, you know, uh, who uh, felt humiliated, who had been... Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, by the system because uh, Bengalis were uh, second class citizens in undivided Pakistan. So they had uh, sort of, uh, they, were, they were smarting under that humiliation, but they didn't have the courage to defect. So the RNDW established contact with many of them and, 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 and uh, encouraged them to leave their uh, posts and join the, the freedom movement, which was a very important role. Fourthly, uh, you know, the Chittagong Hill Tracts, which is a very difficult terrain of, uh, of uh, eastern Pakistan. The Indian Army wanted assistance uh, to uh, mount a special military operation there so that, you know, uh, the Pakistani forces could remain bottled up there and also they couldn't, their escape route uh, was cut off. That task was also given to the head of the RNDW. And finally, of course, mobilizing international public opinion. So all these tasks were done. Uh, uh, there was a, the government, Mrs. Gandhi had set up a committee of secretaries, which was headed by our former ambassador to Russia, Mr. B.P. Dhar. Uh, under, and Mr. Kao was the member secretary of that committee of secretaries. So there was tremendous coordination among all the branches the, of, of the government of India at that point of time. Uh, and the RNDW was one of those, uh, uh, you know, the, the main actors in the whole thing. And if I may just add, uh, you know, since we have a former uh, foreign secretary uh, in our midst, uh, you raised a very fundamental question about what exactly does an intelligence agency do or why an external intelligence agency. You see, the government always wants options to tackle any situation. There could be a diplomatic option, there could be a military option, there could be an economic option. Uh, and in between all this, you know, there is always a gray area where you have, you exercise options if diplomacy is not working. You don't have to outright invade a country or resort to war. You have something short of a military operation, but something going beyond, say, normal diplomacy. That is the extra option which an intelligence agency, if it functions well, is supposed to bring to the table. That is the value that they add. And uh, Mr. Kao was very keenly aware of this, Sandeep, uh, um, you know, uh, he always, uh, you know, tried to think in advance. We, we talked to the Balakot uh, strikes. Uh, honestly speaking, that was also an example in a way of, of, of the foresight, the great foresight that Mr. Kao always used to, to demonstrate uh, because of the searing experience of 2611 when we didn't have the targets, uh, some of us felt that, well, if this happens once again, we should have the targets. So there was foresight. And so Mr. Kao always believed in bringing ext extra options which he could present to the political masters. Right.
Thank you. Beautifully put, Mr. Kumar, uh, extra options. And that's what the political leadership always looks uh, towards and looks for indeed. Nitin, uh, this, uh, how did, what are the aspects of uh, Mr. Kao's personality? You've documented it so beautifully. Literally, his entire life story is in here. It's a biography. What were the aspects of his personality where which came into play in India's finest moment, which is the creation of Bangladesh? What was it about Mr. Kao that kind of, uh, you know, allowed him to take this startup organization, three years old, literally into the thick of battle and do all the tasks, the five tasks that Mr. Kumar so beautifully put out there? What is it about his personality? I think uh, one great attribute of his was uh, very little ego uh, that uh, he had. He was willing to work with uh, almost everyone. Uh, keeping aside his ego, if I'm sure he had one. I never met him, so I don't know. But uh, going by what the, all the accounts that are available, that he was, uh, he had a great ability to network, he had a great ability to lead, and yet remain behind the scene. And that's that's how. And he was a man of action. So, in fact, in Hindi, uh, he said once to uh, someone that "Nasihat mat do, namuna bano." Be an example. Uh, don't give advice, free advice. Free advice is of no use to anyone. So, I think uh, that uh, itself uh, sums up everything because he could uh, coordinate amongst uh, disparate uh, agencies, personalities and yet be focused on uh, the objective that was given to him that uh, Pakistan must be dismembered uh, or at least, you know, uh, you must uh, have option to create another country. Uh, that kind of thing. So that, I think, was his, uh, the most, uh, I mean, the biggest strength that he had was this, that uh, he could remain calm, he could coordinate, he could delegate uh, from what, uh, what one could gather. He had his uh, team, uh, which he would uh, delegate, like Shankaran Nair was his alter ego, I have mentioned it in the book, uh, who was a man of action. He was a man of uh, doing field work and running the agents. So therefore, uh, I have not called Mr. Nathan, if I may, Mr. Yes. Mr. P. N. Banerjee. P. N. Banerjee, I was coming to that. So one Mr. P. N. Banerjee, who was the head of RNAW and IB in Calcutta, was the key personality. I mean, he let him do all the work and liaisoning with the Mujib family and the uh, Awami League and everyone. He had run uh, uh, Mujibur Rahman in a way uh, from 1965. So uh, he didn't uh, let his ego come in between. He let his uh, subordinates do the work and even take the credit when necessary. And the final, um, you know, the intelligence that came uh, when the war was about to begin uh, was, came from Shankaran Nair's sources in Pakistan. From uh, they say from Yahya Khan's office, where he got the advance notice of uh, uh, impending attack on uh, Indian Air Force bases in Western India and in, in Northern India, and uh, that set the ball rolling for it. So I think, uh, to sum up Mr. Kao's personality, he was calm, he was private, uh, he uh, didn't want to take credit all the time, he had a great ability to network and uh, remain in the shadows. Right. And I think uh, that stood him in good stead and he let his team do the work and gave them free hand uh, from what, what, what I, one has uh, gathered really. So therefore, uh, the spectacular success is within three years in creating, uh, in creating Bangladesh. Absolutely, and it's a great example. In fact, this book, and I urge all of you, a lot of you are here, young minds, you should read this book because it's it's actually a it's not just about a spy organization. It's about any other organization. How to set up an organization from scratch and literally inspire your team to deliver results. It's as simple as that. It's a startup and it's a spectacular organization. It's been around for half a century now. And that one line that Nitin mentioned that Nasihat mat do, namuna banu. Don't give advice become an example, lead by example. And indeed, that's what Arun Kao was all about, the gentleman spy master. And I'm afraid we're totally out of time, but I have just one last question to ask both of you. I'm sure there are a lot of students here who would like to know how to join the RNAW. <laughs> Mr. Kumar would be the right person. Well, honestly speaking, at this point of time, if you want to join the senior executive cadre of the RNAW, you have to write the civil services examination and uh, join one of the uh, central services, central services the, the, the All India or the central services, and then put in about five years in your parent service. 
and then the system will find ways of reaching out to you and inducting you into the organization. Yeah, there's no direct recruitment. As a lot of people want and believe that there, there is one, but no campus, I, recruitment. no campus recruitment so far. But maybe we'll have something like that because the CIA and MI6 now have their own websites and they're recruiting from there. Maybe we'll have winds of change in India too very soon. And you might get a chance to do this. Good afternoon, sir. sir. It's an honor to meet you all. And your videos are my metro saver. I still, I was watching your DRDO video <laughs> in the early morning. And sir, the question to you is that nowadays we are seeing the rise of court operations. It is basically a Mossad model that RNAW did not used to uh, like follow. So what are the uh, implications on the foreign relations that India having like in the rise of court operations uh, 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 like abroad? Well, uh, I don't know whether RNW is doing that or not. Unknown men, as they say, are carrying out those operations. So, uh, let's assume if you want to really do that. Uh, uh, of course, one of the tasks of intelligence agencies is to carry out covert operations. It cannot be denied. So, the more operations are carried out, more successful operations, it's, uh, it's also a credit. But the dilemma with intelligence agencies, as Mr. Kumar would uh, tell you, is that you can never claim success. Uh, and, uh, you know, you have to hide uh, those successes because uh, they are not supposed to be made public. That's the dilemma of intelligence agencies, right? <laughs> I think uh, I yeah? entirely agree with you. Mm -hmm. And all that I can add, if I may, to this is, uh, you know, you talk of Mossad, etc. A central objective, all operations of intelligence agencies are supposed to be covert. The RNDW's role in Bangladesh was covert and it remained covert for a very long time. We can discuss it now, you know, uh, half a century later. Uh, and we have uh, Mr. Arun Ka was arguably India's greatest covert operator. So there are shades of covert operation. Helping to create a new country is a huge covert operation. <laughs> Killing one terrorist here or there is a small covert operation. There are many other covert operations. And whether it is diplomacy, whether it is intelligence, or whether it is military, or whatever, uh, you know, we have our own way of doing things which are tailored for Indian conditions or and for, for upholding Perfect. India's national interests. Mm. Therefore, we do not need, uh, we don't need to get uh, sort of overly impressed by what the Mossad or the KGB or uh, any yes. other agency mm -hmm. does. We are what we are and right, rightly proud of what we have been doing, are doing and will continue to do so. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> Greetings, sir. Uh, and I'm very delighted to stand in front of you. And my question is very simple and uh, to Mr. Kumar, sir. Uh, the intelligence we have on Chinese is very limited and inadequate. Uh, so is RNAW is in a position where it can avert any surprises from China like in the 1960s? And uh, my intention is not to doubt the RNAW or the India, but the Chinese ability is to do things without gathering any attention. Uh, so do we have that is what you're asking. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, my answer to you would be all intelligence is a work in progress. Any intelligence agency which claims to be infallible and having all the information that is required at its command uh, would be living in a, uh, in a dangerous illusion. Uh, in intelligence, there is, intelligence is always imperfect. Intelligence is always incomplete. You have to make do, make the best you can with what you have. Uh, so <clears throat> I think uh, whether it is China or uh, China is, of course, a very important and big uh, issue, a, a big target. So obviously, uh, we will always want to do better uh, than what we are, we are doing. And, uh, you know, uh, there will always be gaps. The constant effort should be to be aware of what you know, what you don't know, and try to address those shortfalls. If an intelligence agency is doing that, if the RNDW is doing that with respect to China, 
uh, I think uh, it's good for the agency. We will never be perfect. No intelligence agency is perfect. Nobody can know everything there is to be known about an important target. So you always strive to improve. As far as the uh, Chinese uh, ability to stay, stay under the radar, uh, if I may sort of, uh, I think that is what uh, you've been saying. Well, I mean, the Chinese have, uh, as I said uh, just a short while ago, I mean, they have their own way of uh, doing things. Uh, we have our own way of doing things. Uh, there's Certainly, we are much better off than we were in 1962. Uh, we have many uh, channels of, uh, you know, intelligence gathering, whether it is uh, technical or, uh, or human. Uh, so we are certainly much better off, but obviously, uh, whether it is China or any other target, uh, uh, there will always be scope for improvement in intelligence work. They have their ways and we have our ways. And uh, on that note, thank you very much, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for being such a patient audience. And I'd like to thank my panelists, Bitten Bai, Mr. Kumar. Thank you very much.